Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. Welcome to episode 261 of the Situation Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this program is to help improve situation awareness and high-risk decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-stress, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. I'm coming to you again today from Orlando, Florida, where I'm in town to deliver a program for private industry and a short family vacation. By the time this episode airs, I will have completed my program for the Fire Department Instructors Conference in Indianapolis, Indiana. In today's feature segment, it's part two of a two-part interview with firefighter Tom Ehlers and Fire Chief Wes Cole of the Northwest Volunteer Fire Department in Houston, Texas. I recorded this episode while I was doing a live program at the North, for the members of the Northwest Fire Department and others in the region. This was my second visit to the Northwest Volunteer Fire Department, and I gotta give them high marks for their hospitality. Both visits, they treated me absolutely splendidly, and I really appreciate that. While I was in Texas, I also did three programs for the Baytown Fire Department and a program for the Ponderosa Fire Department, and I'm thankful to both of those departments for their willingness to host programs on this vitally important topic of situational awareness and high-risk decision-making. In case you missed last week's episode, uh, remember that it was part one of a two-part episode um, where we did this interview with, um, with Tom Ehlers and uh, Fire Chief Wes Cole. All right, let's jump into that part two of the feature segment. Um, this, uh, to give you the setup, uh, Tom was electrocuted by a 14,000 volt power line and he lived. And in part one, he told the kind of the backstory and now we're gonna get uh, some of the lessons learned and some of the takeaways and some of the aftermath of uh, how Tom was affected by this event. I knew where the power lines were, but I knew I had to cross the street and I had to cross the driveway to get back to where everybody else was. I couldn't stay where I was at, it was too hot. And um, so we crossed the street, um, crossed underneath the power lines. And when we were crossing underneath the power lines, um, back into the street, that's when I felt, uh, felt like somebody cracked me over the head with a baseball bat. And I immediately knew what it was. I knew it was the power lines had come down um, and then I just disappeared in a bright blue light. Everything disappeared. I couldn't see anything. And I remember telling myself, catch yourself stupid, you're going to fall. Because everything fired, everything locked up, and I just remember falling straight face first. And um, my chin hit, hit square on the ground. Luckily enough, I was still in full gear, so I had my bunker coat on. The only thing I wasn't, didn't have in was I wasn't plugged in anymore. And I hit that ground and it literally felt like someone broke every bone in my body. Um, I could hear the wire still next to me sizzling. Um, I didn't know how close I was to it. Um, we were right next to, I believe, Engine 43 when this happened. The EO of Engine 43 was up on, it's a mid-mount, so he was up on the, um, 
he was up on the, the, the panel. And I just remember in, I remember hearing Mike, Mike Jockums, he was the EO that day, getting on the radio saying, Mayday, 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 I have two firefighters down. And at that point, I wanted to know where John was because I didn't know where he was because I'm still face down, but I hear the, the wire sizzling right next to me. I knew it was right next to me. You heard him call the Mayday. I heard him call the Mayday. The Mayday tones immediately went off. Um, I remember the dispatcher getting on. Chief, we, have, we had a standard procedure for Maydays. I remember radio channels getting changed, you know, for other responding units coming in now. The Mayday stays on the one channel. Um, I could hear people yelling, saying, we're coming, we're coming, we're coming. Were you conscious, conscientious enough to realize the Mayday was for you? Yes. Okay. But I, what I also didn't realize, I didn't know where John was. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what happened to John. I couldn't see him, and I really still couldn't move yet. Um, I tried and I couldn't get up. It felt like my legs were broken. It felt like my arms were broken. I tried getting up, but it was just it, it hurt too bad. And I was finally able to roll over on my my bottle because I figured if I rolled over on my bottle, that was less of me that was in contact with the ground. That because I could hear the wire, I knew if I got up on my. Did bottle, you know where the wire was? I knew that it was next to me on okay. the ground because I could hear it. I could hear the I could hear the electricity, so I knew it was still live. And I just knew, I rolled the opposite direction away from it to get up on my bottle to try to get away from it. Um, I don't know who the first firefighter was to me. All I remember saying to them was, I think my arm is broken. And one of them reached down and grabbed that arm. I was trying to protect my arm. They reached down and grabbed my arm and I just, I screamed. It felt like they had just ripped my arm off. Um, And I could hear other people saying, don't grab his arm, his arm's broken. And that's when they grabbed me by the straps. And got me up and um, started getting me away from the power lines um, so they got me in the street and then I guess another line fell or or that line that was already on the ground started arcing and they wanted me to sit down in the street and I I couldn't do it I was in fight or flight at that moment and I was getting across the street even if I had to take myself across the street I could barely walk like I was hurting so bad. So um, I made it across the street, and that's when I I laid down on the ground. Um, And um, that's when John came over. I saw John, Um, so I knew that he was okay. So I knew the mayday was finally just for me. Um, um, So the the line didn't contact him? No, no. But he did get hurt. He, He fell back. He said he saw me disappear in a bright blue light, and... At first, they thought he was electrocuted um, as well, but John, John and I have talked about this. John thinks that he just he jumped back, and when he jumped back, he jumped into the pump panel of the truck, and his air pack hit his back. And okay. um, so, what part of your body did the line come in contact with? So it hit my helmet first, and then it came through um, came through my left arm. Um, I had first, second, and third degree burns. You can see the two scars there. So there was, it, it came through twice, two different spots. And then it blew out my right foot. So it was crossbody. Okay. So that's why that arm was hurting because that's where the line had that, come in. Yeah, that's where the, the electricity had come in. Okay. Um, so they get you across the street. Mm-hmm. They get you... I guess sitting down or laying down? Or? They, they had me laying down. I, I couldn't hold myself up. Um, I knew that I was hurt. Um, I kept telling them, you know, get my boot off, get my boot off. It's burning. My foot's on fire. My foot's on fire. Um, and there was some hesitation. I had brand new gear at the time. Um, I remember, I don't know if it was Wesley or if it was Maggie. Um, the guys were like, well, let's get his gear off. They took the pack off of me first. And then they were trying to unbutton my coat, and somebody said, just cut his gear, just cut his gear, just cut his gear. I think it was Chief Cole. I don't, I don't, I don't remember. But somebody said, just cut his gear. And somebody was like, what's well, brand new gear? And somebody said, it doesn't matter. Yeah, Chief Maggie was the one who gave the order to cut it off of him. And somebody did say, well, it's brand new gear. And she goes, I don't care. Just get it off of him. Yeah. I mean, I literally felt like my foot was on fire. I, it felt like the bottom of my boot was on fire 
and you know we have those those particular boots that they had a steel shank and the in the those were the globe and they um, had a composite material not steel but it was enough that it um, was able to transmit that electricity through his boot um, it went in his left coat and he had a burn mark coming out of his right boot where it had exited his boot okay three phase power going into that uh, facility so there were uh, three different lines one line hit him uh, we believe that the line may have hit the ground next to John, the second firefighter, and we think it was just enough power to go through the ground and at least cause him to tense up because he had a lot of um, muscle spasms, muscle spasms um, directly after and for about 24 hours he had muscle spasms while he was in the hospital. Okay. So. Tom and John came, we believe, came in direct. We know he came directly in contact. We believe the second firefighter was uh, in close proximity and caused him to receive some of that electricity. Their EO uh, was standing on the pump panel, and um, the one of the lines fell on top of the truck and almost got a third firefighter. Luckily, he was able to jump. Hmm. He jumped away from the line and called the mayday. All right. Keep telling the story from there. Well, the, the guys uh, that volunteer that, that, that was on the, the booster truck with me, he's also a licensed paramedic. So he was, he was the one that was treating me at the time because we didn't have medics on scene yet. Um, obviously, the medics were now en route because that came just automatic aid um, I remember I think you called for a helicopter at that point um, and the guys are cutting my clothes off of course you know they don't know what they're gonna see I don't know what I'm gonna see um, so they were trying to see where the electricity went in me I mean the burn marks on my coat and things like that I mean it, there wasn't a lot to see it wasn't like I was charred and, and all that sort of stuff so at first they were like you know what what really happened but um, I kept screaming, my foot's on fire, please get my boot off, please get my boot off, please get my boot off. So I got my pants off, and it came time to take my boot off. And I, I remember I remember Ian, Ian looking up at me, and he just had this look of horror on his face because obviously as a paramedic, and you know this is one of your own, he had just ridden to the fire with me in a booster truck. And I didn't know what he was going to find. I didn't know if he was going to deglove my foot or you know, what was going to happen when he pulled that boot off. And I just, I remember the look on his face of just, I don't want to do this. And I don't want to, it was a look of just complete horror. I don't want to be here like right now doing this. And, um, I told him, I said, you got to get my boot off. You, you got to get my boot off and just get my boot off. And he pulled my boot off and the look on his face was just a, a sense of relief of what doesn't look that bad <laughs> um, it was about an area at the time it was just an area of white leather about that big so there wasn't very much to see at that point um, still hurt I mean it felt like my leg was on fire I mean like it was just burning my foot mm -hmm. um, I know I think somebody came by with a scoop stretcher off the rescue they were loading me on the scoop stretcher um, and next thing I knew, the paramedics were there. Um, I think there was some discussion about flying me, and then the medics said, no, we're going to take me. And at that point, I just, I mean, I was so exhausted. Like, I just, I mean, I couldn't believe that, like, what had just happened and where I was. And um, I don't usually, <laughs> this is... That was the second time ever that I'd actually had my phone with me in my pocket when I'd gone to a structure fire. Um, well, at first I didn't know it was a structure fire. I thought it was a grass fire. And I hadn't taken my phone out of my pocket. And I remember saying to, to Chief Cole, uh, Assistant Chief Cole, Maggie Cole, Wesley's mom, um, you can't call my wife. You have to call my in-laws and let them know because my wife was five months pregnant. Um, and... The look on Maggie's face, I mean, it's, it's, it's not anything any chief wants to have to do. 
Um, no one ever wants to have to do that. Um, but she did. She she had to call my wife and had to call my in-laws. My in-laws went and picked up my wife. But I remember them loading us in the ambulance. John was sitting on the bench seat, and I was on the um, I was on the stretcher. They immediately did a 12 lead on me to make sure I didn't have any damage to my heart. I don't remember what the outcome of that was. He wasn't terribly concerned about it because they took the 12 lead off of me and put it on John uh, to do one on John. And they gave me some, some pain medication, um, which, which helped, but not really. Um, Maggie was in the back of the, the ambulance with John and I. John was upset because the 12 lead was still on him and not on me. John's older than I am, so by protocol, they have to have it on the older patient. <laughs> um, so John was pretty, pretty ticked off about that for a little bit. And um, I just remember Ian was driving the same guy who I drove in the booster truck, he got in the ambulance to drive. And, uh, you know, I think there was a sheriff's deputy that escorted the ambulance to the hospital to help and all that sort of stuff. And I, I knew I was, I knew that I was, I was hurt. Uh, I knew that I was hurt. Okay. My biggest concern at that time was what did I burn between my left arm and my right foot, which, um, like I said, I had that friend in college who was killed. Uh, he was electrocuted at a construction site. He had the same thing happen and went in one arm, came out the opposite foot, and he burned everything in between. Um, he lived for about six to eight hours after. Um, they just kept removing parts of him until they couldn't remove anymore and he just passed away. So, mm. um, But he burned everything, I mean, his spleen, his intestines, a lung. Um, so I, I understood what could be going on at that point. So, Earlier today, <clears throat> when we were in class and I was talking about some things and you said, wow, he says this ties to some things that I'm, we're gonna be talking about later. There were a couple of things that, that you mentioned earlier today. One of them was intuition and one of them was, you know, when your life flashes before your eyes and then you said you saw this envisionment of your daughter being raised without you and where did where did first of all what is the intuition tie in to the story and then where and when in this story were you when you had thoughts about you know your daughter being raised without you are we there yet did we did we get past that and we yeah we, we, we so it? we got past that I think the intuition was is when we were pulling the the when we were pulling the three inch with the blitz fire on it I just got a real bad feeling about the power lines because I knew where they were. Um, and, was there fire impinging on them? Yeah, I mean, they were in the smoke column for sure. So, I mean, there was okay. definitely heat and stuff impinging okay. on them. Um, but it was still early on. It mm -hmm. wasn't like when we first pulled up, it wasn't quite as bad. Like Chief said, it was blowing through that stack of pallets. So it hadn't quite made it to the power lines. But, you know, Chief is, is very big on training and things. And that's always one thing that, you know, where are the power lines? Where are the overheads? Um, you know, so knowing where that is and what was going on, that was just one of those things. But when I saw, I can't remember who was pulling the blitz fire, but I just got this feeling in the pit of my stomach that this isn't where, we need to make sure that they get out from underneath those as quickly as possible. And that's why we moved the blitz fire over a little bit further down the property so we weren't directly underneath the, the lines. And then you even said, which didn't escape me, but you said, when you were being called back to the muster point and you had to cross under the lines, you actually thought about uh, crossing under the lines might not be. Yeah, crossing idea. at that location might not be a good thing. Um, but where we were and the way the fences and things were set up, we were basically trapped on that property and we had to cross right there. There wasn't, you know, walking down the street and going. You know, we were blocked by fences. We, mm -hmm. we had to go, we had to cross where we crossed. But you were conscientious enough to at least acknowledge the concern for the power lines before you crossed under them. I did. Yeah. But it was, let's get under, out from underneath these things as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. And, and you know, that, that moment of, you know, probably the most peaceful point in my entire life, um, you know, was this event. I mean, when I got electrocuted and I felt that electricity go through me, I knew exactly what was happening. And I knew the potential for 
me to not recover from this. And um, I was very much at peace with that. What I wasn't at peace with was, was what was going to happen with my wife and what was going to happen with my un unborn daughter. Um, it was her life that flashed before my eyes. Um, you know, a little girl taking her first steps and I'm not there. A little girl at her first dance and I'm not there. You know, uh, a girl going through high school and prom and wedding day and, and not being there for any of that. Uh, this is on your mind. This is all on my And it's like an instantaneous, I don't know how to describe it. Like, you know, it, it was just everything went through my mind. And I mean, I could see my daughter as clear as day, like growing, you know, my wife holding this baby. And then next thing you know, you know, this girl walking down the aisle and I'm not there. And it's, it, it was, um, you know, that's what scared me. I knew that I was going to be fine. Like, no matter what happened, whichever way this went, I was at peace. Like, mm. I was at peace. Um, mm. And it, it, I don't know. I, I have a strong faith. I mean, I go to church. I know, you know, I, I, was, I was okay with that. What I wasn't okay with was, was what's going to happen to my daughter, what's going to happen to my wife. Yeah. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, that's what really scared me. Um, and then realizing, you know, when the Mayday went out that there were two firefighters down, that kind of snapped, I think snapped something in me that, okay, I'm still hearing this. Where's John? Because I didn't know where John was. Because mm -hmm. uh, I was, of course, face down in the, in the dirt. Mm -hmm. um, so I couldn't, especially with a mask on, I couldn't see mm -hmm. very well. So Did you, um, you may not remember this, but when... When that electricity went through you, did you lose your sight, lose your hearing, were your ears ringing? Was there any white light in your eyes? It was a, just curious. It I was didn't. the the whitest. I don't know how to describe it. It was like a white blue light, and I everything disappeared. Like everything disappeared. Um, everything was blue. It, it was the most beautiful blue I'd ever seen in my life. I mean, it was the most beautiful light I had ever seen in my life. And I, and I don't know if that's why I was at such peace with everything. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it was just my brain turning itself off going, you know, we know this is going to hurt. Because um, I knew it was going to hurt. I mean, as soon as a wire hit me on the helmet, I knew exactly what it was. And when it rolled off my helmet... You know, it arced and went right through my gear. I, I knew what it was. Mm -hmm. So, Did you think about your friend that you knew had been electrocuted? It wasn't really until you know, it was on the way to the hospital. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, the paramedics were talking about that on, on injuries that I could potentially have. And, and I hurt everywhere. Like every inch of my body hurt. And I didn't know... You know, I didn't know if I was burned internally. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't know. I knew that I had had a lot of electricity go through my body. Um, so that was my concern. Um, the next thing that I remember, I remember getting to the hospital, and they had already given me quite a bit of pain medication. Um, I just remember a lot of nurses and doctors and things, and the next thing I know... <laughs> You know, my the fire marshal is coming in to see me, to take pictures. Okay, hold on there. Are you left behind at the scene when he goes to the hospital? I am. I'm left. This behind. this whole thing. There's no pause button on this incident. You still got thousands of pallets burning and a big ass problem here. Yes. So, what are you thinking about now? Because you know you got this, and you still got that big problem. Yes, and. In the <laughs> You know, it's hard to put the fire in the back of your mind. And to a certain extent, we did. We kind of put the fire in the back of our mind because our focus is on them. And then you realize that you have to take care of this incident, and you kind of got to put them in the back of your mind a little bit. You know, take care of this, but you're still worried about these guys going to the hospital. Right. Um, as we started having a lot of companies come in from 
other jurisdictions and other uh, areas. We had a, an individual who was a district chief for another fire department. He came in, I knew him, I'd actually gone to the fire academy with him, knew his background, and I said, hey, listen, uh, you know, we've had a, a, a catastrophic incident. And he said, yeah, I've been listening, I know what's going on. I said, okay, well, you know, there's a lot of people from our department involved in this. And I think at this point, we need to kind of take a step back. We had the fire pretty well contained at that point. They had gone on to the hospital. We kind of had it contained to as an area, you know, basically a, you know, a half block area. Um, and at that point, our people had already sp basically spent all their energy trying to, you know, get them taken care of, take care of the initial stages of the fire. This is where our mutual aid and our automatic aid has started coming in, taking over the scene. Um, and we've had an opportunity to regroup. Tenders are coming in, starting to set up our alternative water supply. Um, and that point, I told that get the the district chief from another department. I said, my people need a break. They're physically drained. They're emotionally drained. I I need you guys to come in and help us. And at that point, I turned the scene over to one of my district chiefs, or turn over to a district chief from another department. And we did a face to face. And at that point, I left the scene to go take care of my guys at the hospital, knowing that we had left the scene in capable hands to check on them. Okay. Right. So <clears throat> as the dust settles on the incident, you guys all get back, cleaned up. You're at the hospital. Your wife's there. She knows about it. You're getting treatment. Um, I want to cover two more aspects. One, what were the lessons learned from this incident that people could use as takeaways and learning points? And then two, I want to understand what was the longer term prognosis of your condition as a result of that event. So let's first do the lessons learned, then we'll, then we'll wrap up with the, uh, the longer term, you know, I, I mean, I'm interested to learn how long did you spend in the hospital you know, were there surgeries, or, you know, and we'll cover all that. So let's do the, you know, <clears throat> you guys debrief from this and say, what what, what did we learn from this? What did you guys learn from this? Lessons learned. Number one, you talk about it in your situational awareness class, and that is being situationally aware before the call ever happens. Um, we didn't do a very good job of pre-fire planning. We now have a pre-fire planning program in place um, where we visit the, uh, facilities at least once a year all the commercial businesses in our territory uh, it's all mapped out it's in a computer software system that anybody can access from the trucks their cell phones anything basically that is a smart device uh, they can access our pre-fire plan so that everyone has access to it they can look at it on the way to the call that was lesson number one we were not situationally aware that number one we knew there was a pallet company down there but we didn't know that they had that many pallets and they were stacked underneath the power lines. Number two, staffing. We were severely understaffed. Um, at that time of day, you're only gonna get two on the engine and maybe a chief, that's it. Um, that's not the case anymore. There is 24 hour staffing at all of our stations, minimum of three people on every pumper and a district chief. Um, now, granted, most days there's more than that. There's 15 to 17 people on duty usually every day, minimum staffing of 13 instead of three people. Mm -hmm. um, lesson number three um, was that we were severely undertrained, and it was nobody fault, nobody's fault but our own. Um, I was a very young fire chief. Uh, I think it was like 27 at the time. Um, I had taken over um, the department and probably not as well trained as I should have. And so we have changed that. I am very pro training now. Um, we have approached our uh, taxing entity 
Um, we now have about four times about as, as much m money to do training now. Um, so, and situationally aware of our surroundings on the scene. Um, we're firefighters. We're trained to go in, put the wet stuff on the red stuff. There's times that you've got to take a step back and say, we can't manage this. We have to sometimes write off buildings. We have to do what is in the best interest of the firefighters. We take a certain amount of risk being a firefighter. We know that. You know, we're finding out in the last couple of years with a lot of uh, testing and stuff that ISFSI, NIST, and all of them are doing that there's things that we could do to improve our tactics. We've improved our tactics, improved our training, improved our staffing, improved our pre-fire planning. And I think those are the biggest things that we took away from that incident and that near miss. And we've made ourselves better firefighters since then. I guess you couldn't ask for any more than to take that single event and make such significant organizational changes to say, you know, this was, a, this, this is my words, not yours, but this event was a wake-up call to some opportunities to look at things differently and to do things differently. And a lot of organizations just say, yeah, yeah, we probably should. You did. You did. You made some action steps here. Big ones. Big ones. Um, so credit to you on that. What would you learn? <laughs> Trust my gut a lot more. Um, I still would have gone in that house and searched because I don't think I could have lived with myself knowing, especially if somebody was still in that house. Because when we went in that front door, we still, though we went in quickly, we had enough time to get in there, mm -hmm. search what we could search. Um, that was a big thing that, that I learned was, you know, if you can get in there and search the living room or you could at least get in there and search the kitchen or the hallway, mm -hmm. you know, give give somebody a fighting chance. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we got in there and did that. Mm -hmm. um, situationally aware, I mean, definitely trust in my gut a little bit more, you know, um, looking back on it. I mean, you know, <laughs> there were two or three times I said to myself, watch out for those power lines, watch out for those power lines, watch out for those power lines. And that's a big thing. Um, even Chief Cole, I mean, he, he probably remembers this. When I got back, my helmet stayed on my head no matter what we were doing. Overhaul, whatever. Other guys were taking their helmet off. Guys were giving me a hard time about having my helmet on. That helmet saved my life. If I had not had my helmet on, that wire would have hit me in the head, and I would have been dead. There's no doubt in my mind because it would have gone straight through my skull and not through my arm. And that would have, I know... I know that that one would have killed me. So making sure that, you know, you're in your PPE when you need to be in your PPE, you know, you don't know when this is going to happen. Yeah. And how many times have we taken off our our stuff and said, oh, it's no big deal, or yeah. we're in overhaul and taking our stuff out. So, yeah. um, and training, you know, I, I realized that I needed a lot more training. I needed a lot more experience, um, a lot more experience. Yeah. in the whole situation. So, yeah. um, There is one other thing I want to ask you. What was that conversation? What was the conversation like with your, with your wife? <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I was pretty doped up at the time. And, and she was finally able to get back to see me. The fire marshal saw me first. I remember, I remember um, Dean Hensley came in, he was the investigator with the camera, and he came in, and I remember Mike Montgomery, I kept seeing a guy standing at the end of my bed, and so the fire marshal for Harris County was at the end of my bed, and those were the two first guys that I had seen, and finally they, they let my wife come back and see me. And my wife said, who is this at the end of the bed? And I said, I said to her, I said, I don't know who he is, but I know he's pretty important. <laughs> and Did you know him? You just I, knew, just didn't recognize I, I, him. I didn't I didn't I knew who he was. Yeah. I just didn't I think some of it was I was so doped up because <laughs> I had had Dilaudid and all uh -huh. kinds of other pain medication. Uh -huh. So I was pretty loopy to begin yeah. with and they were giving me a significant amount of that stuff. Yeah. So um, you know, it uh, 
Yeah, I, I, we, she was just glad that I was still here. And I was glad that I was still here. Um, you know, after the event, um, I spent three days in the hospital and they let me come home because they had to wait before they could do the debridement. Um, they had to wait about a week before they could do the debridement. Um, so going into my arm, it burned, the electricity burned from the outside in. Coming out of my foot, it burned from the inside out. So that little little spot that they saw ended up being a rather large hole in my foot. Um, I, unfortunately, I suffered fourth degree burns um, on my foot. Um, I burned it all the way to the bone. Luckily enough, the bone didn't die. Um, I don't have any feeling in my big toe um, and, and basically where my big toe meets my foot. I don't have any feeling there. Um, I had to have an initial debridement surgery, another surgery where um, they were gonna, the doctor had a plan on how to fix my foot. Um, we did plan A, didn't work, plan B didn't work. Uh, we ended up on plan like C 2.5 or 3. Um, plan D was to take my big toe and he said if I had taken your big toe I would have had to take your foot. So I came very close to, to, um, to losing my foot. The surgeon did um, something he had never done before to save my foot. Um, they, they filled the hole with collagen. So the same thing they put in women's lips and things. Um, and then they put a wound vac on it and let the blood vessels grow up through the collagen and then I had to have a skin graft over that. So. Um, luckily enough, it took me five and a half months to get back to full duty. Hmm. So, um, and I think we caught a structure fire the first day I was back. Yeah. It was like a four alarm burner and I got my butt chewed when I got home that night because I made it on the news. Um, I think my chief Cole came to the fire with me with another, another firefighter and, and we were on the news up on the second floor of a multi-building apartment fire and my wife I texted my wife and said I'm gonna be late I'm out of fire and she turned on the news and there I was being a fireman and so that was hard um, you know we had to have a serious conversation um, you know I told my wife I'd, I'd give it up if she wanted me to and she told me it would kill you if you gave it up she just didn't have the heart to do it so um, you know I, I did paramedicine and she was happy that I became a paramedic on the truck for a while but then she found out how dangerous it was being a paramedic on the truck. Uh, so she had concerns about that. And then um, I went to a slower department and that kind of helped a little bit. Um, and then I got moved into the fire marshal's office and then into the chief position. So whole different set of, uh, whole different set of, set of rules. Mm -hmm. I think Chief Cole brought my gear. Yeah, let's get a look at this. So this is obviously my left uh, my left arm here. You can see the hold, hold up there so I can you can see the two scorch marks where the electricity went through. Okay. And then you can see here these are just pinholes. I think everybody Chief went over my gear and couldn't find anything and the guys initially just thought that maybe I had a, a hole in my gear. Wow, but then when you set it up next to each other you can you can match the, the yeah. holes and tell that that's where that's the really power line. That's really small. And then you can see on the inside where it burns more. And then I wish I had my t-shirt here, but my t-shirt is singed in this whole area here. So. And you talk, we were talking about where it hit his helmet. You can actually see all the arc marks where it arced off of his helmet, even though this is a composite material it still had enough electricity to arc across his helmet and cause all those burn marks. And then lastly, we talked about where the, um, the electricity came out. I don't know if you can see it on the podcast, but we've got it circled where the power actually came out his foot. It's tiny. It's like the head of an ink pen pin. I mean, tiny, tiny. Yeah. See, I, I don't know why I think it would be like a big blowout or something. Hmm. It's my belief that if that would have had been a steel toe and, and, a, and a steel shank in the, in the bottom of that boot, mm. I think it would have done more damage. Yeah. And it's composite, you said. Composite it's a composite material. material. It's not actually steel. Yeah. Wow. And all this is just from it being cut off. Yeah, right? this is all yeah. just them cutting it off. Wow. Huh. 
I don't know. I expected that to be look worse than it did too. Uh, they, did they ever determine what the um, voltage was on the on the line that hit you? Fourteen thousand volts. Oh. Oh. I feel like I'm talking to a ghost. You, you're you're not. I mean, some days I I feel like that. It almost defies comprehension as to how you would live. The, the grace of God, that's all yeah, I can think of. There's a plan for you, for something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know for sure what, but holy cow. Yeah, if you wouldn't have had your helmet on. No, I, I, I mean, and, and <clears throat> still to this day, I mean, I, I yell at guys, you know, put your helmet on. And uh, guys would always say, why do we need our helmet on? Why don't you know? I'd be on a traffic accident and have my helmet on. Out in the middle of the roadway. And guys are like, why do you have your helmet on? I have my helmet on. Hmm. So, you know, it, 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 PPE is, is you, you never know. That's why you leave these things on. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's why you leave these things on. And, yeah. um, if, if coming up that driveway, if I had done what I'd done before, taken that helmet off and pulled my mask off and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, gear, it would have, I'd start gearing down. and You know, it would have been a different story. I know that. Yeah. And it was hot that day, so it's not unrealistic no. that you would do something like no. that. I mean, I don't know how many times we'd come out of structure fires, and as soon as we were out of the fire... You know, we took our helmet off, pulled our hood down, yeah. took our mask off. Yeah. That day I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I left it all on. I think it was because it was so hot. You know, I, we didn't, when we came out of that house, we didn't know what we were going to be into. So, but, yeah, the the equipment, um, it, it saved my life. Um, hmm. if, if I didn't have on all my PPE, I, I know, I know I would not be here. I know I would be right. I, I agree. So. Uh, is there anything that we would want to cover that we haven't covered in the discussion or the questions that I've asked? Any important takeaways left unstated? Dr. Gasway, being the fire chief of a fire department of 75 people, it's my responsibility that all 75 of those people, when they come for their shift, they go home in the same manner in which they came and they go home to their families. Don't take training for granted. Don't take what we do for granted. Make sure your people are trained. Um, don't put it off. Don't, uh, don't take it for granted. I think that uh, prior to this incident we had a I know I did. A little bit of cockiness. This was a real wake-up call, and uh, I did a lot of soul searching after this fire. Uh, I didn't go. After I left the hospital that night, I went home and I didn't sleep. Um, it's a hard thing to take, and it's a hard pill to swallow that a couple of firefighters almost didn't go home that day and um, I see things a lot differently now um, I know that until the day I retire I want to learn something new every single day mm -hmm. I want to be able to go to training classes and and pick up things and and be a better firefighter be a better fire chief be a better instant commander and you can't say it's not going to happen to us. It can happen to anybody at any time for any reason. And don't be the near miss. Don't be the statistic. Don't be a line of duty death. Don't take training for granted. Don't take what you do on the fire scene for granted. I feel like this really changed you as a person. I can tell you it did. Um... I was very young. I think I made some decisions that day I shouldn't have made. 
um, and it's decisions I'm going to have to live with the rest of my life. But the best thing is, is that nobody lost their life that day. Right. And now I can take those lessons that I learned and, number one, be a better fire chief, better incident commander, better firefighter, better person. But I can also pass that down and train other firefighters to not make the same decisions that I made. Because if something I teach another person keeps somebody from getting killed, it was worth every bit of it. Yeah. And if it's something that I can go to training and learn to keep from doing again or to keep from happening at all, it was worth it. Yeah. Well, this, I think this episode will be a real eye-opener for the people who watch it to realize just how quickly it can change, Mm -hmm. how vulnerable we are, how we think about it but then still do things, how you thought about your, your unborn daughter living without, without, a, without a father, how it changed your entire perspective on training and your commitment to personal development and the others in your department being the best that they can be and not taking things for granted. There's just so many good solid takeaways from this interview. And I want to thank you both for sitting down with me and being so open and honest and raw about your feelings about this event. I mean, there's no, there's no guardedness, there's no cockiness, there's no um, ego here. This really was, from the heart, a, a true representation of your of your personal experience in a way that I think that the viewers are going to say I could see me in your position I could see me in your position I can see my opportunities as you framed your opportunities and it's the best it's the best gift that you can give after something like this happens is to kind of peel the layers of the onion back and let people see the real inside emotions and feelings of how this affects us, how it changes us. It doesn't happen for everyone. There's there's people that just dismiss things like this as coincidence. Let's move on. They don't change anything. That's not what happened here. That is not at all what happened here. I mean, I've been here twice. You know, it's, I mean, it's a gift if I get invited to an apartment one time. I've been back two times in two years on the same topic. That speaks significantly to this passion for awareness and safety and improved decision making. And and I see it in your people too. You know, I I get the sense uh, that, that that they get it in their enthusiastic learners, and that, that all I guess really just all comes together as a part of this and a part of your changed view of leadership and and commitment and uh thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you chief thank you for letting us uh pass our message along yeah i i appreciate it so much thank you to tom ehlers and fire chief wes cole for sharing this remarkable story and your lessons learned Remember, this is part two, so if you haven't uh, listened to part one, you might want to go back and and give it a listen, too. Well, I never thought that I would be here, but here I am in the fifth anniversary year of this show. I'm very proud of that. We are the longest-running, consistently broadcasted, independently operated Internet show focused on a singular mission, to improve the safety and survival of individuals and teams who work in high-stress, high consequence environments. Let me pause for a moment to elaborate on one component of that last statement, and that is the consistently broadcasted part. A new episode of this show has been released every Tuesday for the past five years. I've not ever, ever missed an episode on a Tuesday. Never, ever. No other podcaster in this space can make that claim. In fact, most podcasters fade out after just a dozen or so episodes. 
or their podcasts very inconsistently. Not me. You can set your clock on the fact that you're going to have a new episode in your feed every Tuesday morning. Fresh, new content to listen to. It's my promise to you. Now, I have to admit it's not always easy to keep that promise. Sometimes my travel schedule gets kind of janky, and I can be up till after midnight on Monday night recording these intros and doing the editing so that you have that episode by 7 a.m. Tuesday. I totally understand why other podcasters fade or are inconsistent. As I've stated in past episodes, it can get pretty lonely here behind the mic and camera. And by lonely, I mean that the podcasters or the video casters rarely get any feedback from you, the listeners and viewers. Sure, we see the stats that tell us the episode's getting downloaded thousands of times, but rarely does anyone ever write a review or send an email with some feedback. So we don't ever really know if the show's being inspiring to others or not. But I just keep on keeping on putting out the best possible content, safety focused, that I can come up with. And now I want to thank John Krause who sent me an email a couple weeks ago providing some nice feedback about the show and that really put a smile on my dial. And, uh, and, and thank you John for that. To honor those who've been watching and listening to this show, I'm going to do a giveaway of some products from our sponsors and supporters. So keep watching the upcoming episodes and keep an eye on the SAMatters.com website for that. Hey Ritz, this is Dave Dotson. Hey, congratulations. Fourth anniversary for your webcast. That is awesome. That is absolutely awesome. And hey, thanks for the opportunity to let me do one of your podcasts. And uh, I think our episode's number 66, right? It's still out there online for you guys to look at. Uh, but again, Rich, thank you so much for that opportunity. And congratulations. The Situation Awareness Matters show was launched in 2014 with a purpose to give a platform to those who have had near-miss events to share their stories just like the one you just listened to. When I'm on the road delivering the classes on Situation Awareness, I often ask attendees about their near-miss events and have them tell their stories in class. And they have shared some amazing, amazing stories. And as stories like the interview that you just um, heard with the members of the Northwest Fire Department that in motivated me to launch the podcast in the first place so that their lessons could be shared with the bigger audience. That's you. The Situation Awareness Matters show, podcasted as SA Matters Radio, and our companion video program, SA Matters TV on YouTube, along with other videos posted there, have enjoyed over 800,000 downloads. And that number just blows my mind and far exceeds all my expectations. I'm so thankful for your support, and I feel so honored to be able to provide a platform for those amazing stories to be shared. If you like the show, please do me a solid favor. Subscribe. It's easy. Just subscribe to the show. Then you'll get, the, you'll get it in your feed every week. For the audio version of the show, it's SA Matters Radio on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, or iHeartRadio. The video version is SA Matters TV on YouTube. And if you find the show valuable, I'd really appreciate it if you'd consider giving it a rating and a review. Your ratings and reviews help others to find the show, and more importantly, your feedback inspires me to work even harder for you. I think Rich's, Rich's ability to, to, to connect with any crowd, that's a, that's a gift that he has, and, it, and it's easily transferable. This is the second or third time that I've heard him speak. There's some teeth to, to the information that he, that he brings. It's been really good. Good mixes. He knows when to throw in a joke here and there to get you back involved. Some tools. Um, I'm a new lieutenant, so very, very interesting. And some of these things I can take back to the station and use with some of the new firefighters I have my, on my crew. Something to get you thinking about your job more. Big picture type stuff. I've seen him before. A good review for sure. I have heard him before, yes. After he speaks, there's usually an enlightenment because now they're more aware of what's going on around them and what they're experiencing as they're responding to calls. He's, he's very, very knowledgeable. I'm enjoying it so far. And that intuition, that's a big one. Um, the video that he just showed up here, we're getting a lot out of this. I think this is a really good seminar, especially for new people and old. But I think it's, it's very informative. This talk gives us more ammunition to, to do all three. They're relatable to what we have experienced or 
very well code experience, so he makes it easy to let the knowledge sink in. I mean, it's awesome. A lot of stories you can usually relate to yourself and, and calls you have been on, you know, aha moment. Like, he just helps you focus on picking out the right things. It's, it's awesome. It's a refresher and keeps my eyes open. It's good stuff. If people listen to the message that he has, it's an incredible message delivered by a very com compassionate person. Strategy and tactics are going to always change. Situation awareness is it doesn't change. You're all, it's always there. He's got some good stories to tell, and he's very thorough with his stories, and it's uh, interesting listening to him. Very clear speaker, and he, he talks um, on our level because he's been there, he's been in the trenches. I think he's doing well, and I'm looking forward to the second half. Since 2007, the Situation Awareness Matters instructors have helped more than 1,300 organizations and have trained over 75,000 individuals on improving high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, public transportation operators, aviation workers, oil refinery process operators, and more. If you work in a high-risk, high-consequence decision-making environment, we're here to help to improve your safety and your survival and to help you accomplish the most important mission of all. And that is to go home to the ones who love you. I would like to take a moment to thank and honor the companies, organizations, agencies, and departments that have hosted recent Situational Awareness Matters training for their team members. The Baytown Fire Department in Baytown, Texas. The Ponderosa Fire Department in Houston, Texas. The Northwest Volunteer Fire Department in Houston, Texas. The Maryland Fire Rescue Institute's National Fire Service Staff and Command Program in Towson, Maryland. The Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard in Oahu, Hawaii. And the Fire Department Instructors Conference in Indianapolis, Indiana. If you're interested in knowing where we're gonna be upcoming, here's the schedule. April 14 to 16 at the Washington Fire Training Officers Association Conference in Wenatchee, Washington. April 25 at the International Association of Fire Chiefs Company Officer Leadership Series in Atlanta, Georgia. April 27th at the Cook County Emergency Management Agency Seminar in Grand Marais, Minnesota. May 7th, the Scott Township Fire Department in Evansville, Indiana. May 8th, the FAST-19 Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. May 20, the Washington, uh, May 20, the Buckley Fire Department in Buckley, Washington. May 21, the Washington State Fire Chiefs Association Conference in Kennewick, Washington. If you want to see the locations of all the upcoming events, just head over to the essaymatters.com website. All the events are listed there. If you're interested in hosting a program, just click on the Contact Us tab on the top of the SA Matters homepage and I will give you a call. It's a really easy thing to set up. If you want to become part of the SA Matters community of learners, there's several ways you can do that. Just click on the show notes to see how to get connected with us by signing up for our monthly newsletter, by subscribing to the SA Matters radio podcast, by subscribing to the SA Matters TV YouTube channel, and how to follow us on the social media channels of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. There we are sharing ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 261 of the Situation Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guests, Firefighter Tom Ehlers and Fire Chief Wes Cole from the Northwest Volunteer Fire Department in Houston, Texas. Thank you to our awesome sponsor, Midwest Fire. Hey, if you're in the market for a pumper, a pumper tanker, or a brush truck, you need to check them out at MidwestFire.com. Thank you to our associate sponsor, Chief Miller. Thank you to all the companies, agencies, organizations, and associations that have hosted Situation Awareness Matters training programs. 
Thank you to all the organizations that have hosted live stream training programs where I come to your organization live via the internet to train all of your members, dialogue, interaction, back and forth, two-way, just like a live event, except a lot cheaper. Thank you to the more than 2,500 students and graduates of the highly acclaimed Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy. The feedback I receive from Academy graduates is just amazing and very humbling, and thank you for that. But most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.